fiction. And to start with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our judge, Claire Lawrence, who I've just been introduced to. So, well, I'm kind of introduced to. I waved up. <laughs> Welcome, Claire. Claire Lawrence has been published in Canada, United States, United Kingdom, and India. Her work has been promote, performed at the National Gallery in the UK and on BBC Radio. Claire's work has appeared in numerous publications, including Geist, Litro, Raven's Perch, Brilliant Plast Fiction, Curating Alexandra, and Bangalore Review. Her creative nonfiction has appeared in Just for Canadian Doctor's Lifestyle magazine. Wow. Claire Lawrence has a number of prize-winning stories, including winning, of course, because that's winning art classes right on contest night 2018. She was nominated for the 2016 Pushcart Prize. Her goal is to write and publish in all genres. She lives in British Columbia, Canada. So welcome, Claire, and thank you so much for being agreeing to be our judge this year. So same format, but that's okay. I'll ask the, uh, the winners up uh, one at a time, ask them to read their story, and then I'll ask Claire to come up and, and share her comments. If that's okay. Great, so first place, roll on the drums. Some have gone wrong. Oh, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually. Some have gone wrong. Donna Terrell. Hi everybody. Well, I was so excited to um, win this category and I'm happy to be here to share share my story with you. Um, I'm always torn as to whether something is non uh, is uh, creative nonfiction or fiction because my question to everyone is if you change the time the people the place and the era is it fiction or is it nonfiction mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of nonfiction in here this is called summer gone wrong 1979 this summer was unlike any others that Fiona had experienced in her secluded mountain village Kootenai summers had a rhythm of their own early morning garden watering and emptying of slug traps kayaking to the far side of the lake for picnics on the sandy beaches in the shadow of the Valhalla Glacier, hiking into the back country in search of alpine flowers and wrapping towels around shivering kids at swimming lessons in the glacial lake. But this summer fell out a step, the normal cadence off tempo. For one thing, there was a beer strike. Not knowing how to break the habit of a pub stop on the way home from work, the highways crew, the miners, even the bank manager still gathered at the local watering hole. They took to drinking hard liquor with the Texas Pride near beer chaser. The AA members were getting really worried they were gonna run out of that too. <laughs> Schedules were organized to drive down across the line on a rotating basis and bring back the allowed two cases of watery American brew, like Miller and Budweiser. This concerted effort saved the day for a young logger and his waitress girlfriend who feared that their long planned nuptials would become a dry celebration. Fiona developed a taste for gin and tonic. She was in the custom of stopping at the pub for an on tap draft after work and be before she picked up her two preschoolers from family daycare. Without fail, at first sight of her, they launched into a game called Mommy's Here, Everybody Cry. <laughs> Jean, their caregiver, would give Fiona a helpless look and say, They've been great all day. I don't know why as her two charges would cling, whine, and try to scale their mother's body. Sometimes, in anticipation of this howling greeting, Fiona, from her perch on a red vinyl bar stool, would order a double gin and tonic to fortify herself, changing gears, she called it. Even after the beer strike ended, it reminded her happy hour drink of choice. Sometime after the snow cleared off Idaho Peak, but before the annual demolition derby, a puzzling incident occurred. Someone tried to burn down the post office. It was clearly arson, evidenced by a broken window, a charred pile of last year's income tax forms on the post office floor, and traces of gasoline. The mystery was never solved, but there was much speculation over coffee hour. Could it mean a Sons of Freedom revival? Or perhaps a remorseful romantic was having second thoughts and wanted his or her letter back Pension and unemployment checks had to be reissued and temporary quarters were set up in the general store. The normal rhythm of one's daily mail pickup and the trading of current gossip at the post office steps was disrupted. The temperature climbed and no one could remember the last time it rained. 
The needle indicator on the forest fire hazard sign at the entrance to the village was set to high. Many of the local men had been recruited to firefighting teams by the forestry department, a regular source of seasonal employment. A gauzy smoke cover floated high over the valley, filtering the sun's August heat and bathing all things below in ethereal dullness. There was a breathlessness to the air quality, a sensation of waiting, waiting for the blue sky, the young men and the cold beer to return. Helicopters were out in full force, so many, like busy dragonflies around a stagnant pond, droning and whirling against the listless sky. Amongst her Texas pride drinking cronies, Fiona heard the theories begin. That many choppers, forest fires be damned. The head mechanic at the highway's yard smacked his palm on the table, causing the foam on his beard to slop over his glass. I bet my bottom dollar they got infrared cameras and are looking for backwoods pot growing gardens, damn hippies. <laughs> With the reverberations of the helicopter blades still pulsating in the air, the alarm went out. The posters went up. Two local boys were missing. Technically, one boy and one man. Brian Ross was 10 years old, the middle son of a single mother, and known to be a handful, often found at the center of boyish mischief. The other, Jake Winter, was a man in his early 30s with the mental development that roughly made him Brian's equal. Jake and his mother ran the local bottle depot. Jake had a slight build and was mildly, mildly microcephalic. He loved to stand out front on the sidewalk and converse in a nervous staccato with everyone who passed by, often, often answering his own questions and with his eyes blinking and hands fluttering. Both families were new in town and like many other newcomers, were most likely in search of a fresh start, an accepting community, and the familiarity of small town life. By late afternoon, the volunteer fire brigade had organized groups to search the woods and lake shore nearby, where, while the Anglican church ladies brought coffee and sandwiches to the fire hall. Miners' headlamps were issued to continue the hunt into the humid, moonless night. Fiona had seen the two together the previous morning, she was driving into work about 10 a.m., later than usual, since at dusk on the previous evening, a VW van loaded with her partner Matt's old Vancouver friends had chucked up their rutted driveway for an impromptu visit. It turned into quite a party, but she rose early, fired up the wood cook stove, and left the slumbering guests with fresh coffee and banana muffins, warm. When she spotted the two boys, Walking side by side, she thought it was an unlikely pairing, but figured that they might be searching the ditches for returnable bottles. She let herself into her office and proceeded to check her telephone messages and make the necessary rescheduling changes. Her job as the coordinator of the area's home support service was a lucky break, provided a steady paycheck and a few occasions every year to fly to Vancouver for meetings and training. Most newcomers were forced to sacrifice career aspirations when they chose the Valley lifestyle cobbling together a livelihood as best they could. Matt had drawn the daycare pickup card today. He and the children sat huddled in front of their 14-inch Sears black and white TV, playing on the Atari, a computer game in which they owned a 25% share. When Fiona arrived home with a bag of groceries, Matt looked up with a questioning expression, anything? Fiona shook her head, not yet. She hated the cooing pigeon sounds the game made, and the rapt attention that most often kept all three of them from acknowledging her presence. Their setter cross, Sasha, grew restless when the family became transfixed, staring at the beeping box. She would bark sharply in startled surprise when the sudden cheering and high fives would erupt. Fiona pocketed a dog treat and called for Sasha to follow her outside. The smoky, ca the ca sorry, the smoky sky had taken on an eerie greenish cast, ominous and otherworldly. Now, sitting in the field of leafy bracken ferns, she scratched Sasha's head and felt the ground beneath her vibrate. Was it a distant rolling thunder or more helicopter rotors? Something was off kilter. Sasha's ears were on high alert. She ignored the treat Fiona offered and emitted a series of agitated high-pitched yips and whimpers. Don't worry, girl, life is good. The Atari gets passed on tomorrow. Let's take a walk. Sasha ran on ahead, then backtracked, ran a circle around Fiona to make sure she was following, then took the lead again. 
They kept to an abandoned railway track that bordered Fiona and Matt's property. The far side of the old rail bed fell away to a creek far below. Centuries of spring runoff had widened the creek bed as the stream swelled and receded with the pace of the melting snow deep in the Purcell Mountains. From her high vantage point, Fiona could see through the quivering birch trees the mouth of the creek, where it widened and emptied into the deep, cold mountain lake. Some old timers claimed the lake to be bottomless in spots. The creek sliced the surrounding village in half, but was spanned by a steel bridge. It was on this bridge that Fiona could make out a parked white vehicle with a red rotating light on, off, on, off. She watched as the doors of the ambulance were closed. It moved off towards the hospital. She didn't hear a siren. She felt the first raindrops on her face. Sasha stood beside her and waited. The rain's momentum increased. Fiona closed her eyes and raised her face away from the empty bridge. The rain ran down her face and diluted her tears. When she opened her eyes, the sky cover was thinner, delicate, the cool air weightless, washed clean of smoke. No helicopters throbbed and pounded. Let's go home, Sasha. Fiona drew a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.